Aloha and welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and today I'm joined by a special guest who's going to help me uh, unravel some of the puzzle of what's happening today in European politics, the crisis of democracy, the rise of populism, the growing protest movement in France that's taken on, you know, added dimensions in recent days. Uh, and joining me today is a special friend, uh, Dr. Mohamed Badin El Yatoui. Uh, Mohamed, thank you for joining us here on uh, Global Connections, and I look forward to this conversation. Welcome. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for inviting me. Now, uh, Mohamed, you're a professor of international relations in Mexico now at the University of the Americas. Uh, you come from France, however, and, and of, of Moroccan heritage. Maybe tell us, or some of our listeners, we have listening all over the world, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, but a little bit about yourself. You, uh, you've you been in Mexico several years now, but uh, you've got a European uh, background as well. Exactly. I have uh, more than two years now in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was born in France. I lived all my life in France. My dad's are from Morocco. But uh, I lived all my life in France, and uh, I'm a professor of international relations. I studied history and uh, international relations. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I'm working a lot about uh, geopolitics yeah. and global security. Excellent. And also a brief time uh, visiting professor, a researcher in Medellin, Colombia. Exactly. I was, I was visiting professor in Colombia, Medellin, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Oxford yes. uh, a few months. And uh, yes, I, I worked a lot about uh, Latin America during, the, during my PhD thesis. Yes. And uh, now I'm working more about geopolitics and yeah. global security. Excellent. And of course, uh, you know, we're looking at this uh, unraveling, you know, uh, dynamics happening in Europe. And now you're seeing it from afar. It must be interesting because most of your life there immersed in it. And now you're seeing it in some ways from a different perspective. I wonder briefly if you might comment about that. How does it look from, from afar? It's really strange, Carlos, because, you know, now I'm living here. Yes. Uh, more than two years. And... Uh, it's, it's really strange because when you see what is happening in Europe and in France, uh, it's my country, it's not so surprising. Mm -hmm. Because when I lived in France uh, till 2016, everybody said one day we will have one new movement, revolution, contestation. No one knew really which kind of movement, mm -hmm. which kind of protestation. But everybody knows it. And now when I'm seeing what happened uh, in France, it's really strange because for me, it's normal what is happening. Yeah. Well, in many ways, of course, the story, the history of France is one of protest, dissent, uh, exactly. you know, a lot, lot of popular movements over, the, over centuries now. Uh, but uh, maybe to bring us to focus, uh, we're looking in very recent years, we've seen a, a variety of crises happening in, in Europe. Uh, uh, several years ago, the dramatic uh, refugee and migration crisis that was flooding, particularly in 2015. Uh, we had some shows back then that were able to profile some of that. Uh, but more recently, we've had, of course, the, the rise of, in general, a, a, a tendency of uh, right-wing populism. A lot of it is driven by the anti-immigrant sentiment, a lot of other issues, too, a crisis in the European Union. Uh, that's several dimensions, but, it, of course, most prominently, we've uh, focused attention on the Brexit, the, the UK's recent uh, referendum to, to exit and all the drama playing out there. And most recently, uh, after, I think, last November, we had the rise of a new social movement in France, uh, the uh, Yellow Vest, uh, uh, Jean... Les Gilets Jaunes. Les Gilets Jaunes. These are the young, uh, well, not young, but these are basically uh, uh, taking on a symbolic uh, look with this new vest. Uh, let me start, and maybe I want to first show a map of uh, that we have here uh, to share with our audience. Uh, you know, we can see over the last few years a rise of nationalism in Europe, and this is pretty widespread, uh, even in Scandinavia, you know, in Sweden, which has a large immigrant population there. Uh, this past couple of years, they've elected a large uh, percentage of what used to be a fringe marginal group, the Swedish Democrats. Now they've gained more in places like Germany and Austria, even Switzerland, uh, Spain, and today Italy. We see, again, widespread um, Hungary, uh, the, the Viktor Orban, the leader there, obviously a strong anti-immigrant, uh, uh, right-wing populist, Poland. Wherever you look, we've seen this growth. And I wonder if we might just begin, I mean, from your perspective, what do you think are some of the 
driving forces? What's causing this, uh, you know, this rise of, of right-wing populism? You know, I think that we have different problems in Europe. Mm -hmm. you, you have economic and social problems. Mm -hmm. I think the European Union didn't understand a lot what is globalization. Mm -hmm. And the French situation is more complex because France has its own tradition, mm -hmm. really far from the liberalism, an economical level, yeah. with a welfare state, That's right, a strong role really state, strong, of course. et cetera. And what is interesting is that you talked about a lot Poland, Italy, mm -hmm. et cetera. All these countries had a reaction to the globalization mm -hmm. and to the migrants. Yes, yes. But in France, you have the same problematic, but with something more. In the French history, never we had a president like Macron. Mm -hmm. Macron came as an economical mm -hmm. secretary. A technocrat. In, in many ways, he was outside of the system, the traditional political system. He said that it was outside of the and system, yet, and yet but the yellow vest yeah. said that he, he worked for the bank yeah. Rothschild. Yeah. He was the advisor of François so he, Hollande. He's certainly an elite. He's part of the establishment. If you want to call it that. Exactly. Yeah. And what is interesting is he's the first candidate and the first president who assumed to be a liberal. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm a liberal. Mm -hmm. I agree with the process of globalization. I am accepting all the new rules of the globalization. And the French people have to accept it. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is that he won the election in 2017. Mm -hmm. At a moment when UK mm -hmm. Brexit and, yeah, already voted to exit and, and the US Trump. Yes. And in all the Occidental world, the Western mm -hmm. world, we had a new necessity of protection mm -hmm. against the globalization. And he came with a project of a globalization is the future. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really strange. And if we make a historical we can see that in Europe, France, it's not the first time, but it's an exception. In 19, 1979, Margaret Thatcher came to a power in UK. Mm -hmm. In 1980, Ronald Reagan. They said neoliberalism, yes. free trade, etc. And in France, what happened? 1981, François Mitterrand, yeah. a socialist yeah, with from... four communist secretaries, mm -hmm. came to the power. So from the left, yes. It's really strange yeah. what is happening in France because we have the impression that France is part of the history, but I think it's something different. France it has its own history history, it's a member of Western mm -hmm. Union, the sure. European Union, Western countries, but at the same time, France is an exception. Yeah. A strong welfare state and contradictions with its historical partners. Oh, very well put. And, and of course, one of the things, and we touched briefly on it from your early comments, is what we're seeing in many parts of the world in Europe in this case is in some ways a reaction to this globalization process. Uh, uh, some have even described it as a disconnect between the elites and, and maybe even elites who've been in favor of the European Union, this deepening integration now for several decades, uh, and a disconnect with the masses, the people who are feeling, uh, you know, somehow either left out or growing, you know, disparities. Uh, even this European project, you know, quite ambitious. And, you know, if we were here 10, 20 years ago, it was a slightly different story, the, you know, maybe the early honeymoon of the EU. Today we see throughout it a growing anxiety uh, and yet still a disconnect. Many who feel, look, it is the future and it's hard to reverse it. Uh, despite uh, the UK's situation, theirs is rather unique. They were always reluctant partners. They were always skeptical. And, you know, we have yet to see how that's going to play out. But, uh, my point is that I think for the other Europeans, you still get a sense, you get a sense that they're still, uh, or, or how do you see, maybe another way to phrase it would be, how do you see this Brexit uh, unfolding? Uh, what impact do you think it could have on the remaining European Union? It, it could go either way, uh, or how do you see it? I think the Brexit is a very good strategy for the UK mm -hmm. to understand. I think the British understood what is happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. You have the domination of Germany, economical level and UK can't accept to be only one part of the European yeah. Union. They want to be the leaders yeah. and they can't be yeah. the leaders. Yeah. I think the problem is for France because Macron now have, has two problems. A domestic problem with 
Yeah. Gilets jaunes, yes. yellow vest, yes. and, and the European problem, because we can see that Italy with Salvini and Di Maio had a good relation with uh, Visegrad group, yes. with Poland, Hungary, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and France. Yeah. And it's a problem. We have a, an isolated Macron in France and in Europe, mm -hmm. and only after Two years. Yeah. It's yeah. because two years ago when he came to office, there was a great deal of exactly. excitement, euphoria. He represented a new, fresh face. Uh, his honeymoon ended somewhat, and now he's facing some tough challenges, particularly domestically, right? Uh, uh, I wonder, if it, do you see any different role for him at the international level? Is he essentially together with Germany's Angela Merkel? I mean, these are the two leading players. But you know the problem in, of the European Union is that the three biggest countries are in crisis. Mm -hmm. UK, UK Germany, with Brexit, France, yes. Germany with Merkel, who is losing yeah, all yeah. The, the local elections, mm -hmm. and it's the end. Yeah, yeah. It's and after long, so long time, it's the end. And Macron came with the, 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 the goal to be the, lead, the new leader, mm -hmm. the new fresh leader. Yeah. But the problem is that he is the leader of a sick country. Yeah. France has an enormous debt. Mm -hmm. Enormous deficit, a problem of international trade with an annual deficit at the, for, the, for the trade. And so it's a big problem. France is not a competitive country mm -hmm. inside the European Union. So you can't be the leader if you have so a yeah, big, yeah, big yeah. problems in your own country. So, and with the yellow vest, it's a new situation for him because he has to deal with a European. Who don't, I want to deal with him, and he has to deal with its own country. And we don't have to forget that Macron, when he came to the power, everybody said he came with 67 percent yeah, yeah. in front of Marine Le Pen. But the reality is that he came with only 24 percent of the first leg. Yeah, yeah. And in this 24 percent, if you are calculating the people who went to vote, it's only 18% of the total. So in the end, in many ways, because of the second round system where the, the top two leaders would then go into the final, exactly. he was up against this very far right candidate. And so many of those who supported him were more protesting the possibility of the exactly. alternative. So not so much excited about him, but just saw him as the, exactly. the only choice. And I think it was a mistake of uh, international media. Say it's a fresh young yeah, leader. Yeah. But the reality is that it's... Victory yeah. not was not a strong victory. Yeah. So it really wasn't a mandate. It wasn't like the you know majority supporting him. It was more stopping this other rising right wing right. party uh, and and giving him the support. So his honeymoon, uh, however elusive it was, is definitely over. And now he's confronting. What what we'll do right now, Mohammed? We'll take a short break right now and come back. I want to maybe look a little more in depth at this uh, fascinating uh, protest movement that's emerged, the, the Yellow Jackets in France, and see. How does it represent continuity, more of the same? Again, a history of protest, but also a new dimension because a lot of it is focused on specific demands for, yes. you know, for wages, for you know, various uh, topics. Uh, so we'll come back in just a short break. Uh, uh, joining me today is Dr. Mohamed Adin al a uh, professor of international relations here at the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico, a uh, specialist on international relations, geopolitics, uh, and uh, France. Uh, and so Come back and join us for the rest of our conversation here on Global Connections. We'll be right back after this short break. Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha.
Welcome back. Welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host here, Carlos Juarez, and joining me today uh, from the University of the Americas Puebla in Mexico, Dr. Mohamed Adin El Yatui. And uh, Mohamed is a professor of international relations here in Mexico. He's been here several years now, originally uh, born and raised in France of Moroccan heritage. Uh, so he's got a good understanding of uh, uh, European politics, especially France, but also the region of North Africa, Middle East, uh, many others. Uh, spent some time in Colombia. So he's got a good understanding of uh, geopolitics, uh, security, et cetera. Uh, and what I want to turn to now, Mohammed, is, uh, you know, we've been talking now about just the rise of challenges in Europe, uh, protest movements, uh, populism, uh, a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. But in the case of France, it has a particular, uh, uh, you know, phenomenon that's now uh, end of last year, I think by November, we had the rise of this new yellow jacket, uh, yellow vests, uh, yeah, the, uh, the yellow vests. And of course, uh, tell us a little bit about what it is. Uh, the yellow vests are not just random out of nowhere, but they actually come out of what uh, basically, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, all automobiles, cars in France are required to have these vests if you have like an accident or something. Exactly. But now they've become an important symbol for this protest movement. So maybe describe a little bit the movement itself, uh, what it represents. Uh, and in particular, you know, on one hand, you can see it, you know, a continuity. France has a long history of protest and, and you know, mobilization. But is there anything distinct or unique about this one? Because a lot of it is driven by domestic politics, uh, wage issues, and, and so on. So I think we have, with the yellow vest, a typical French case. Mm -hmm. Is that we have uh, 18, mo 18 months after the victory of Emmanuel Macron, mm -hmm. a movement began in Facebook, mm -hmm. in YouTube, yeah. with this moment of yellow vest, because yeah. everybody as yeah, in their cars. Uh, let's see if we can get help putting a picture. We have a picture here of a uh, protest uh, taking place in front of the uh, iconic Arc de Triomphe in, in Paris. Uh, and again, uh, symbolizing it, it's been going on, in fact, pretty regularly. Exactly. It's not every week they have uh, ongoing uh, protests. Since the 17th of November, mm -hmm. six months now, each Saturday we have a, a movement. Mm -hmm. The problem is that at the beginning, it was a tax movement yeah, yeah. because so protesting a, a, a tax protesting initiative. against yeah. all the tax, the new taxes mm -hmm. of Emmanuel Macron. Because as I said, it, Emmanuel Macron came with a big debt, mm -hmm. and he has obligation to be respectfully from the European conditions mm -hmm. and obligation yeah, yeah. to have a diminution of sure. this debt. So he began to with new taxes new and these new policies. Was considered by the French people as uh, can say a threat of a welfare state, and the reality is that the problem of Macron was at the beginning he didn't accept to talk with them, and he didn't accept to listen to mm. them. And in France, with the political system, the Fifth Republic, mm. it's a monarchy. You have a president, you have a Congress who has not power, and with Macron, a new situation. His party, his political party, La République En Marche, was created four months before the election. Yeah. Brand new. Movement Brand new. Party and the problem is that at a local level, he didn't have this link with yeah. the population, with local representatives who have the possibility to talk with. And his personality, some of French people and yellow vest said arrogance. Yeah complicated the situation yeah. and it's really interesting because all, yes, all the, re the revolutions in France began with a tax problem. The French Revolution <laughs> yeah. in 1789 began with a tax problem. Mm -hmm. So it's really French. Yeah. It's a political problem, but typically French. And of course, these movements, I mean, they've had episodes, uh, especially in the early days, considerable violence, protests that you know, yes. took on a very ugly dimension. Uh, as you mentioned, it begins with a focus on tax, but it's kind of moved on to become even deeper than that. Uh, economic justice, the inequality yes. of the wealthy. Uh, we saw in the last week a very dramatic, uh, sad tragedy with the burning down of the Notre Dame, Notre -Dame uh, Cathedral there. And while it was remarkable that within hours, within days, there was a huge, you know, collection of funds, donations from very wealthy Quickly, that became another protest because, well, why, you know, how can they get a billion euros? These this donations is yeah. our problem now yeah. because Emmanuel Macron tomorrow will make he, a new speech. Yeah. yeah, so sort of an annual or uh, State of the Union equivalent. Or no, like in, in France, it didn't exist like that, but okay. it's with this crisis, uh -huh. he had to make his speech mm -hmm. last week. 
but it was the day that Notre Dame was burning. Yes, yes. So he cancelled it, and it's tomorrow. Okay. But your problem now, that he has to justify why these people have a lot of money accepted to pay for Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and he's saying all the days to the French people, we don't have any money. Yeah. So it's a contradiction, yeah. and it's a new problem for him. Yeah. And it's a new problem because he made something in January. He said, we're going to make a great debate. Mm -hmm. Le Grand Débat. Mm -hmm. He went to all the cities of France mm -hmm. to talk with the people. Because as I said, it as a new party, yeah. he didn't have new a representative at a local level, local representative. Yeah. has to go himself. Yeah. But yeah. the yellow vest are saying, we are not accepting that because this real debate was managing by the government. And the government was saying, yeah. you can speak with the president and you can speak with the yeah. president. So it didn't represent enough of a, you know, grassroots uh, from below. That's it was sort of imposed. But I think more to the point, obviously France has, a, you know, a political party system very complex, but it has some, you know, long established parties that have obviously been well connected to civil society. He comes to power rather, you know, again, maybe part of the establishment, but not the traditional political establishment, doesn't have a party system in place. And so now to try and build support or to address this movement, he doesn't but have it. You know, he made one mistake because he, he criticized a lot during the electoral campaign, the traditional parties, mm -hmm. the Socialist Party mm -hmm. and the Republicans, yes. the right party. And he said, I'm going to establish a new world, a nouveau monde. Mm -hmm. And all the members of this government are technocrats. Mm -hmm. No one knows them. So the problem he has now, he has to defend himself from politics. He doesn't have anyone to help him and to try to justify his decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's a big problem for him because we have the situation and the French people like the historical version yeah, yeah, yeah. and they are saying it's like the King Louis. He says, during the revolution, he is alone against the population. And a lot of yellowists are using the word Jacri. Jacri was a social movement during the monarchy in the 17th century mm -hmm. against the tax, against mm -hmm. the royal taxes. So they are using French Revolution, the 17th century with Louis XIV, mm -hmm. and the French people like the history, yeah. the British history. Yeah. And they like to make cooperation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So that helps both inspire the movement and also give them additional fuel and, yes. and, and uh, passion. And uh, uh, it's fascinating to see that. But maybe, uh, as, as, you know, as you describe now, the domestic politics very complex, very uh, challenging for uh, the president, Macron. Uh, let's move it back just now uh, where it fits into the broader maybe patterns of what's happening in Europe. We're seeing, again, on one hand, uh, growing uh, disillusionment. And maybe, again, what I would parallel is a disconnect between elites and, and popular sectors, the, the crisis in Brexit can be seen that way, even the election of Donald Trump in the U.S., sort of a, a disconnect. Uh, it's also a criticism of globalization. In other words, there have been winners, but there's also losers, and, and sometimes the, the losers are very painfully, you know, hit. Uh, uh, what would you say, again, maybe about comparing some, or, or maybe putting France's current dilemma in the context broader of Europe uh, and where it fits in? In the context of, of Europe, we have some elites, not only Macron, but in mm -hmm. all the countries who are saying to the people, the free trade mm -hmm. is the only solution mm -hmm. since 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And we have one part of the population who say the same, we have more problems with the free trade than without the free trade. Yeah. The problem is that the globalization, it's a global concept. Yeah. And the European Union, didn't find the solution to participate to globalization mm -hmm. because we are obligated and at the same time to protect the welfare state. Yeah. And the European Union has a problem is that we have 28 countries with the UK, mm -hmm. 28 countries with 28 welfare state systems. Mm -hmm. And they are not the same, they have not the same welfare state system, yeah, yeah. and they don't have a new model. Yeah. So you have a discussion, but this discussion, this negotiation didn't have and don't have any goal. You have the French, not only Macron, before Hollande, Sarkozy, Chirac, who are, were saying everybody 
has to copy the French model. No? Yeah. UK was saying we have a model of welfare state, the Thatcher and Blair mm. destruct <laughs> a, a rich part of, of it. And we are saying the best model is the UK model. Germany is saying Germany is the best model. And now we have a visible group. Mm -hmm. We say, we have to follow any of those. We of have course, to follow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We have our own model. We don't like migrants. We don't like all these progressist yeah. decisions mm -hmm. of a society. And we have a crisis because we have a crisis between the elites of the population mm -hmm. and we have a crisis between the elites yes, of yeah. the European Union. Yeah. They, don't all, they don't all speak the same voice or, or, or perspective. The problem yeah. is that they don't have the same history. Yeah. If you are French, you don't have the same history than Poland. Yes. Poland, yeah. it was the communism, it was another history, yeah, yeah. it was a relation really complicated with the USSR. Mm. France had its own history. If you are Spain with the European Union, you build a new country. Yes. Portugal, Absolutely. it's the same. Yeah. No, I think that's very valuable. You made reference a couple of times to Visegrad, and this, of course, refers to the Central European states, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, that uh, are post-communist states. And so in many ways, they are new. They are new to the whole project of democracy and liberal liberalism. Uh, liberalism. Um, and while their early days after communism was, you know, sort of a honeymoon excitement, joining the EU was their ticket to move away from that. Uh, I've been traveling to that region since then. And uh, of course, what you see now is a real disenchantment where, okay, they are now connected, yes, but also there's been a divide in those countries. There's been a desire to want to control more their own uh, culture and identity issues. And so strong anti-immigrant anti sentiment, maybe most visible in Hungary, but it also Poland, uh, and I think increasingly a sense that the European Union project has been more intrusive maybe than a lot of them like, uh, you know, setting standards that they all have to abide by. The problem we have, for example, for the migrants, mm -hmm. the migrants are coming from the south mm -hmm. of Africa mm -hmm. or from the east, the, the Middle East. Yes. So we have, you have Greece, you have Spain, you have Italy, mm -hmm. you have the countries of Visegrad mm -hmm. group, who are the first countries to receive yeah, people. Yeah. They're like it's the, a the, geographical problem. That's right. And many of them are, are receiving them, but they're often just the transit places because they want to go to Germany, to, exactly. to Sweden. But the, the UK. problem is that Sweden, UK, Netherlands are saying it's not our problem. And the other ones are saying we don't want these people because we are not the richest countries of the European Union. Sure. And you don't have any European program, mm -hmm. global program, yeah. negotiated between the with European Poland, countries, yeah. with these, these countries, yeah. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, etc. You have only national... Yeah. Well, ad hoc here, you know, maybe the Italy with Libya, etc. So I think it underscores how this migration issue has been a challenge for Europe because there is, challenge. you know, they don't have a single universal policy that everybody accepts. And then when you have efforts from, uh, let's say, Angela Merkel to try and impose that and tell every country you must have a quota of this many, that many. And they don't accept it. That's, they that's, accept that's it. a big no. So there's been a growing disenchantment with that, right? And, and so I think the migration crisis, it was quite prominent now four years ago. While it has been managed, it hasn't been solved and it remains a contentious fight. I think what is a big problem is that in the case of the migrants, we will not have any agreement mm -hmm. at the European level. Yeah. But the problem is that the only solution is at the European level. Yeah. So yeah. you have a situation, Macron is living in a situation of minority. Mm -hmm. Merkel too, you have a majority of countries who didn't want migrants. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they don't want to cooperate with these states. Yeah. With co-development, because the solution development of course, with yeah. Africa and Middle and, East. And even working with Turkey as they've got to try to stop it at the source and maybe even prevent yes. them from making this but massive The flow. problem is now in Turkey because, for example, Erdogan lost Ankara and Istanbul mm -hmm. because one of the most important elements was a part of the Turkish people are not accepting that Turkey is receiving three million yeah. Syrians. Yeah. And they're saying to Erdogan, you, the agreement you filmed, you signed with the European Union for a few billions of euros, it's okay. But stop. Yeah. We don't want more Syrians. Yeah. And the Syrian, the first country 
Yeah, you know, it's Turkey. Of course, yeah. So we have a global problem and we have only national solutions. Yeah. And we can't have national solutions because it's not efficient. Right. No, no. And, and again, this is the complex world we're in. A lot of uh, global issues, transnational issues, they require solutions on a macro level, but achieving that is not easy. The consensus is not there. Well, Mohammed, we've had a great conversation and trying to unravel some of the complexities of European politics. Uh, I really appreciate your insights. Uh, we'll have to have you, you know, we'll come back and continue this dialogue as it unfolds. Uh, I appreciate this. And for our listeners, a chance to hear some perspective informed by, uh, obviously, an expert uh, comes to us from France, uh, now in Mexico a few years, uh, Dr. Mohamed Badin al Yatwi, uh, and uh, delighted to join us here on Global Connections. We'll finish on that and uh, hope you can come back and join us for our next show here. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Thank you for joining us here. Aloha.